still focused on the crowds that were pressing forward. I will be what you called me to be. I say We're thankful to have uh, Brother O.J. and Brother Allen uh, with us today, and I uh, want to mention that uh, we can we can hold up to ten people uh, max, and uh, if you ever want to join us, uh, if you'll text me and let me know, we'd be glad to try and make sure there's enough room for you. So why don't we go ahead and and just open with prayer, ask the Lord to be with us tonight. Lord Jesus, we do love you, and Almighty God, we are just so grateful and so thankful for the opportunity to be here this evening. We pray, Lord God, that you would visit with us. You've said in your word that where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you would be there uh, in the midst of them. We pray, God, as we're dispersed and scattered and assembling together virtually over the Internet, we pray that that you would count that and that you would be with all of us wherever we may be viewing this from, whether here at the church or in our homes, wherever it may be. And we pray, God, that you would open our minds and hearts to your word and help us to understand and help us to obey your word. We pray, Lord God, that you would uh, visit with me and help me, anoint me, and pray that you would give me the unction to speak in your behalf to your bride. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, emailed the handout to, to everybody for lesson two. Uh, mentioned to you in my text message that we notice that lesson one was uh, partially recorded about the first 32 minutes, so we're going to redo that uh, video uh, later and make that available because we'd like to have the whole series out there for everyone that would 
uh, care to take a look at it and benefit from it. And um, so we'll go over the handouts that were sent out with lesson one at that time when we uh, re-record uh, lesson one. So today we're going to proceed with lesson two. And uh, this particular lesson deals with uh, from the fall to the flood. It talks about the righteous family of Noah and talks about the uh, soon and possibly right now fourth uh, judgment of mankind that uh, this COVID-19 possibly may play into a part of Latter-day Judgment. But uh, so let's talk first about uh, from the fall to the flood. And um, we're going to talk about uh, Adam and Eve outside the garden. We're going to be dealing uh, in our Bibles from Genesis chapter 3. Hopefully you have your Bible with you. If not, perhaps you can go and, and get that so you'll be able to follow along. But in Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, it says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, talking about deceiving Eve, uh, because you've done this, um, you are cursed more than any cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And uh, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. He shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have not eaten and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for, for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. And uh, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken." For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin, and he clothed them. In uh, Revelations 13, 6 to 8, it says, uh, it talks about the Lord, and it uses this these words in the very last part of verse 8, it talks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so in talking about that the Lord God made tunics of skin to uh, cover Adam and Eve's nakedness, we can, we can go to uh, Revelations 13, 8, and it talks about a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And Revelations 12, 11 says they overcame him, talking about the devil, by the blood of the lamb. And so it is reasonable then to uh, assume that the Lord just didn't make tunics of skin out of thin air. Uh, he operates within the bounds of the creation that he made most of the time. Um, there are some creative miracles that, that he's done over the years, but most of the time uh, he operates within the system or the boundaries of the creation that, that he made. And uh, some of the exceptions in terms of creative miracles would be the sun moving backward uh, in the Old Testament under uh, Joshua. Um, in the New Testament, uh, creating um, uh, wine from water, uh, calming the storm, uh, uh, causing growth of, of uh, people's limbs, things like that. that's creative miracles. But most of the time, the Lord operates within 
the foundation, the framework of the world as, as we see and experience it. And so it's reasonable then to say that, you know, a lamb was slain, just like Revelation 13.8 says, there in the garden, and that's what God used to clothe Adam and Eve. And this lamb was a foretelling of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself, uh, God manifests in the fl flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, that would later come and shed his blood for all, uh, for whosoever will. And so we can move to uh, Genesis chapter 4. Uh, Adam and Eve are placed outside the garden. Uh, there's a cherubim that's put there, and we're at the actually the tail end of Genesis chapter 3, uh, starting around verse 22. And uh, the cherubim's put there. They're, uh, Adam and Eve are forbidden from coming back. The cherubim is going to protect uh, the tree of life uh, so that man does not live forever in his fallen state. And Genesis chapter 4, it talks about uh, how that in verse 1, that Adam knew his wife, Eve, she conceived and bore a son, Cain, uh, which means possession, and uh, he was the first son and father of the Ken Kenites, <coughs> which is a tribe in between southern Palestine and the mountains of Sinai. <clears throat> and from the Kenites come Jethro, which is the father-in-law of Moses and grandfather of Manasseh and Ephraim. So it's kind of interesting to me that, you know, out of, out of, bad, out of bad, God can always bring good, you know. And uh, out of a bad situation, bad things, uh, God can always bring good. And so we have Cain. Uh, we'll learn more about what he did in case you don't know, but uh, uh, you know, father of, of the, the Kenites, uh, from whom Jethro comes, father-in-law of Moses, grandfather of Manasseh and Ephraim, and gave some good advice to Moses that we'll learn about later. And so uh, they bore Cain and, and uh, said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. Uh, Eve said this, and she bore uh, another son this time, uh, his brother Abel, second son, whose name means breath. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord and also brought uh, the firstborn of his flock. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord, the scripture says, had respect unto Abel and his offering. And this word respect means to look upon or to have regard for someone in their prayers or offering. But it says he did not respect Cain and his offering. And in that context, did not respect, it means to look away from, to turn the eyes from anything. To let alone. So it kind of gives us a sense of appreciation when it says the Lord did not respect Cain and his offering. However, he did respect Abel and his offering. And so with Abel, respect to look upon, have regard for, uh, to have regard for someone's prayers and their offering, but not respect to turn one's eyes away from, to look away, to leave or let alone. And so Cain was very angry. King James says very wroth, which means to be hot, to be furious, to burn, to kindle anger. And of course, you know, if you've uh, done any kind of camping, you know, kindling, when you kindle a flame, kind of stoke it, feed it, and uh, so Cain was angry, meaning to kindle anger, to heat oneself in vexation, to be incensed, and his countenance fell. And Proverbs 15, 18 says, a wrathful man stirs up strife. And uh, 
but he who is slow to anger allays contention. In uh, 1623 Proverbs, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes the city. Proverbs 19.11, the first part of that verse says, the discretion of a man or the understanding of a man makes him slow to anger. And uh, if ever you get angry, you can always pray and ask the Lord to give you discretion or to give you understanding. And, uh, and he has a way, God has a way of unlocking one's understanding in a situation like that and helping you to see maybe the other side of the argument. In Ecclesiastes 7, 9, it says, do not be hasty in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Uh, Proverbs 18, 23, the poor man, this is one of my favorite verses in scripture. It says, the poor man uses entreaties meaning earnest requests, petitions, or supplications. But who answers roughly? The rich. The rich answers roughly. And so we can uh, then surmise that, you know, if, if we answer somebody roughly, then it's because we view ourselves as rich. I don't need that person. I don't need what they offer. Therefore, I can speak to them roughly. But if we view ourselves as poor, uh, we will uh, answer someone with entreaty. We'll, be, we'll ask, uh, our requests will be earnest, will be in the form of a petition or supplication. We won't be answering roughly. So the poor man uses entreaties but the rich answers roughly. We can gauge uh, accurately our viewpoint of ourselves by the way we answer a person. And so why did the Lord regard Abel and his offering but not Cain's? Well, you know, here's some possible reasons. If you want to have an authoritative answer, you have to have uh, a visit with the Lord and ask the Lord. But here's some answers from his word. Well, uh, Genesis 3.17, we learned that the ground was cursed. Maybe that's one reason why he didn't regard uh, Cain's offering from the fruit of the ground. Leviticus 17.11, another possible reason, says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul, Leviticus 17, 11. And then in Hebrews 9, 22, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no remission, Hebrews 9, 22. Another reason uh, may be Genesis 3, 21 and Revelation 12, 11, we've already talked about these, but when God made tunics of skin to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness, it's reasonable, as we said earlier, to assume that he killed an animal, shedding its blood, probably a lamb or a sheep. And at this time, since history was passed along carefully by word of mouth, because this was back in early days, this was the way that uh, history was communicated was oral tradition, oral history. And uh, so the history of what had taken place in the garden, surely Adam and Eve communicated that to their children. You know, one whole lot else going on, right? <laughs> Amen. So, but surely things that were as as traumatic, monumentous as what occurred, what they had and what they had blown and how it went down, surely that must have been communicated by Adam and Eve to their, to their kids. 
And, um, and so they must have known, we can assume, right? They must have known that the preferred method or, or uh, the significance of blood sacrifice from the beginning, from the get-go, of covering their nakedness, covering their shame, covering uh, their, their sin. They must have known that. And so for Cain to do what he did really kind of seems very presumptuous uh, and just kind of off-kelter. So the Lord says to Cain, verse number 6, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will, will you not be accepted? And so there always is, I believe, an expectation from God's point of view that repentance is accompanied by a change in behavior for the good, according to God's view on the matter, not ours. You know, so Cain, what you think or what you feel is the right thing to do or the right way to go don't matter because the house belongs to God. And you're not coming in his house unless you do what he says for you to do and what he expects of you to do. Amen? Take your shoes off, right? You're not coming in the house unless you, you know? So the Lord who owns eternity and owns heaven as well as earth is Lord of all, says Cain, you know, and has an expectation. If you want to knock on my door, you better come in this manner. And uh, so it's not unreasonable for God to have those kind of expectations and to expect that when we repent, that our repentance is that we are going to change according to his standard and his expectation and his wishes. And, uh, and then he'll accept us. Praise God. That's, that's the promise. If we do repent, he will accept us. And so... We can see from uh, this account, Genesis chapter 4, the account of Cain and Abel, that simply believing in or on God, that God exists, is insufficient. We have to obey God. We have to do what God says to do. Not just believe in Him or on Him, but obey Him. And so our faith in God and His Word must motivate and result in us amending or changing our ways according to his will. And so the Lord continues in verse 7 and says, If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And so sin is described by the Lord as though it were a living, breathing, thinking, conniving, and plotting thing of some kind that desires us. And it will rule, the Lord says, over us, or we will rule over it. One way or the other. One, one way or the other. And so it will, sin will either dominate us, or we will do, whatever it takes to overcome it. That's how sin is described. As some intelligent, deceitful, deceiving, conniving, thinking, living, breathing, plotting, something that's out there to destroy us and take us down. Or we overcome it. And how do we do that? Obeying God. Obeying the Lord. Romans 6, 15, great passage of Scripture dealing with this topic. It says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the, under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? You belong to it. Amen. If you give yourself to someone or to something as its slave, 
then you belong to it. It has ownership of you. Right? That's what that's according to the word. That's what the word says. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in terms, verse 19, of, uh, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you present your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, right? I mean, if, if, we, if we do not repent of a sin that we are presently doing, what this verse says is that lawlessness that we are giving ourselves to will lead to more lawlessness. That's what the Word of God says. So we can't play with sin. We can't tease sin like it's, you know, uh, a little cat or something, or a little dog. We're going to get bit by the dog, and we're going to get scratched by the cat. You know, it, uh, it's going to lead to more lawlessness. It's deeper, uh, bad, or graver, more significant. And what you can control now, you may not be able to control later. And uh, so sin is not something to to tease with or to play with. Uh, when we know that what we're doing is, is contrary to the Word of God, we need to get a, as far away from that thing as we possibly can. So, uh, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for, for uh, holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit. Of course, what is fruit? It's something outward and beneficial that is produced. Having become slaves of God, you have fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death and the but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Cain talked with Abel, his brother, verse 8, Genesis 4. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. This was the first murder in the Bible and the first unending cry. The Lord said to Cain, verse 9, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now this word keeper is the same Hebrew word, shamar, that was used in Genesis 2.15 when God uh, created Adam, placed him in the garden, and asked him to keep it. Keep the garden. Tend it and keep it. And shamar means to guard, to observe. So in talking about your brother Abel, uh, Cain said, am I my brother's keeper, shamar? And what that word means is to guard, observe, give heed, have charge of, keep watch and ward, protect, save life, watch, be a watchman, wait for, treasure, Celebrate, keep Sabbath or covenant or commands. Perform a vow, preserve, keep within bounds. Everything to uphold and edify life and goodness. And so the Lord then said, verse 10, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries. Amen. It cries. That's not cried, past tense. Abel's dead, but his blood cries. That's an ongoing thing. That's an action verb. It just, God can just hear the crying, hear 
Abel's blood, the cries of his blood being shed. And uh, he said, the voice of your brother's blood cries, action verb, out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you, a fugitive and a vagabond shall you be on the earth. In Hebrews 11:4, it says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. And uh, so we can fast forward a little bit, and, and, and we learn that Cain, uh, verse 16, went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And so what a tragic statement. Uh, and in the end uh, of you know, Cain's life, uh, he, we see that he went out from the presence of the Lord and there's nothing that ever says, no record in Scripture that ever says that Cain ever repented. Nothing that says he ever rediscovered the presence of the Lord. So again, it just underscores and emphasizes we can't play with sin. We can't mess around with sin. If, we're, if, if we have a struggle, if we're struggling in an area, it, it's my belief it's because we're not repented in that area. We have to fully repent in order to overcome sin. So there were men that walked with God in your handout. Um, Seth was one. Um, Adam knew his wife again after Abel was murdered and uh, she bore a son called his name Seth which means compensation and uh, interesting that when Seth was born that that's the name that they gave him compensation Seth compensation and compensation means a making up for, for someone's loss, damage, or injury by giving the injured party an appropriate benefit. And so if you have suffered loss, I would encourage you, take it to the Lord in prayer, for he is the great compensator. Amen. For God, he said, uh, Adam said, for God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh, which simply means a man. And, and he was the son of Seth. But the scripture says, then men began to call on the name of the Lord. We're in Genesis 4, uh, 26. And uh, so then men began to call on the name of the Lord. When God compensates, what is born can produce a spiritual revival. And then another man that walked with God is Enoch. In Genesis 5, 21, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. He begot Methuselah and, he walked, and Enoch walked with God. 300 years, had sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And he walked with God, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And uh, so here we have this man, Enoch, the father of Methuselah, and we'll later learn in reading the scriptures, he was the great-grandfather of Noah. And in Hebrews 11, 5, 6, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And verse 6, six says, but, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who dilig diligently seek him. And then another man that we can read about in the Old Testament is uh, this fellow by the name of Noah. 
in Genesis 6, 3. Genesis 6, 3. The Lord says, My spirit shall not strive, meaning to judge, contend, plead, or quarrel with. My spirit shall not uh, strive with man forever. Uh, there is an end point when God says enough is enough. You know, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. We don't ever want the God, we don't ever want God to say regarding us, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. That would not be a good outcome. And uh, but this is what this word means. My spirit uh, shall not always strive with man forever. Um, and so there is an end point when God has enough. For indeed, he is flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. And so the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And I must say about that, that intentional thoughts, intentional thoughts, lead to intentional actions. Be careful of our thoughts. Regulate our thoughts by replacing inappropriate thoughts with the Word of God. We can reprogram this computer that's parked between our ears called the brain. And so when we have inappropriate thoughts, we cast those thoughts aside place them uh, in the abyss, and we replace those thoughts with uh, thoughts from the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And um, the Lord said, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I'll destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I made them. But Noah found grace uh, in the eyes of the Lord. And this word found, of course, is a past tense, a verb in the past tense that uh, signifies that Noah was a seeker. He was seeking for something. What was he seeking for? Grace. The grace of God grace in the eyes of the Lord. So to be to have found means that he was seeking, he was searching. What was he searching for? Grace, meaning favor, kindness, acceptance. And who was he searching that from? The Lord, the eyes of the Lord. So to be someone that finds grace, we have to be a seeker. We have to seek the grace of God. Amen. Uh, grace isn't just poured on us because we don't deserve it. That's, that's my viewpoint, which I believe is biblical. We've got to be a seeker. We have to be a seeker. We have to be intentional about our actions and behavior. We have to be seeking favor. You ever uh, seek someone's favor by punching them in the mouth? Doesn't work too good, does it? No, if you want their favor, you're going to have to be kind to that person. You're going to have to be respectful of that person, respect their wishes. You're going to have to be careful not to do things that offend them. And uh, typically, you know, the way, the way that we work, if they have stuff that we want or need, then we tend to be more respectful. Well, we should be respectful for everybody. Doesn't matter who. But... Uh, my point being that if you want kindness, favor, acceptance for someone, then you're going to have to conduct yourself in such a manner that they're willing to give you that grace, that kindness, that respect, that acceptance, that favor. Amen. Amen. And so verse 9 says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, meaning lawful, righteous in conduct and character. Think that's why he got found grace? He was a just man, lawful, righteous in conduct and character, or as justified and vindicated by God. He was perfect, meaning complete, whole, 
entire and sound in his generations. And Noah walked with God, not ahead of God, but with God. Not away from God, but with God. Praise God. God didn't walk with Noah. Noah walked with God. That's what the Bible says. Don't expect God to catch up. Don't expect God to be with us when, and I know he's omniscient and all that stuff. I get it. But the point being, Noah walked with God. There was not a expectations on Noah's part. If you exist, if you're real, if you're out there, then walk with me. No, it doesn't work that way. We have to walk with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. According to Genesis 5.32, Noah was 500 years old when he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Can you imagine that? Still having kids when you're 500. Praise God. Amen. That's why he needed grace. You think? Could be. <laughs> All three of his sons were married before entering the ark. And Genesis 7, 6 says Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came on the earth. So conceivably, it may have taken about somewhere around 100 years for the construction of the ark. Don't ever say that you're too old to do something for God. <laughs> I'm too old. I'm too young. Noah was 500 when he started construction of the ark. 600 when the flood came. Stayed faithful for 100 years, and all that he won was his family. If all that you win and all that you keep is your family, it's worth it. All the effort, all the pain, all the sweat, all the planning, every outreach service, every, every evangelistic service, every Bible study taught, if your family is all that, you, then it's worth it. That's all that Noah had. The whole rest of the world went the way of the flood, their own way. But all that Noah saved was his own family. Sounds like he was doing something right. So Hebrews 11, 7, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen. The Bible says not yet seen because uh, the, up until the flood, there was no mention of rain in, in the Bible. And um, we, we find in Genesis 2, 6, that a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So until the flood, we have the, the word rain is not mentioned. And so Noah was being asked by God to prepare this tremendously huge undertaking that was going to take him possibly a hundred years to complete, and he had never seen the evidence, had never seen it rain, and, and this is what was going to happen. And so he was divinely warned, Hebrews eleven seven 7 says, of things not yet seen, but nevertheless, man of faith, he did what God instructed him to do because he had more faith and the voice of the Lord and the word of God than what he saw or heard with his natural eyes and his ears. He had more trust, more faith in the word of God than his, what he experienced with five senses. And I believe that's kind of the way that we need to be, right? More trust in God and his word than the storm that we're feeling, seeing, raging around us. I'm going to stand on your word, Lord. I'm going to depend on what you say, though I've never seen it, I've never experienced it, I've never, never tasted you know, rain, I've never seen rain, never seen a flood, 
all those things I've never seen happen, but God, you said it. That settles it. I believe it. And so he prepared an ark for the saving of his house by which he condemned the world, became heir of the righteousness, which is, uh, which is according to faith. And we also learn in Hebrews eleven eight by faith, Abraham obeyed. This is later, I know, but it was so appropriate, I just wanted to include it. By faith, Abraham obeyed. So again, faith is tied to obedience. Uh, when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Not like some of us fellows, you know. <laughs> before GPS and all that. I don't know where I'm going. Uh, But he went out by faith, not knowing where he was going. And so in our handouts, we're going to uh, Roman numeral 2, the righteous family preserved. And the the first point here is faith and obedience is required. God told Noah that he would destroy humanity who had corrupted themselves with violence on the earth. And he told them to build an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in it, uh, cover it inside and out with pitch, that is uh, tar. Told them the length, 300 cubits, the width, 500 cubits, the height, 30 cubits, make a window from above, one cubit, set a door in it, make it with three decks. The Lord said he was bringing floodwaters from under heaven, right? What does that sound like? Rain. And God said, everything in which is the breath of life shall die. Arkencounter.com says the Hebrew long cubit, measuring anywhere from 19.8 to 20.6 inches, was likely used in constructing the ark, using the slightly larger number of 20.6 inches, the ark would have been about 515 feet long, Uh, 85 feet wide and 51 and a half feet high or one and a half football fields in length higher than a four-story house with floor to ceiling heights of 12 to 15 feet each so Noah had a salvation plan was it specific oh yeah We have a salvation plan today. Is it specific? Since it was specific for Noah, would it be reasonable to assume that today's salvation plan is not ambiguous, it is not obscure, it is clear, uh, it it is understandable, it was clear and understandable so that Noah knew exactly what to build, exactly what would withstand that storm and that flood that would take out all other living creatures that were not in the vessel. And so uh, what did Noah's salvation plan require? Faith in the one that gave the plan, yes. Uh, What else did it require? Obedience. Faith is always coupled with obedience for it to be effective. Faith alone or faith by itself is insufficient biblically. In the account of the worldwide flood, God spares the obedient, but the disobedient is not spared. James 2, what does it profit, my brethren? Verse 14, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, Can faith save him? James 2, 15. If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? What good is it? What good is it? You see they have a need, you and you have what they need, and you do absolutely nothing about it. What good is your faith? So, verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. 
Amen. But someone will say, verse 18, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God. You, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So then you see that a man is justified by faith or by works and not by faith only. Verse 24, a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Whereas the body without the spirit. Now get, get this analogy, get this illustration. As the body is dead without the spirit, so faith without works is dead also. Faith always must be coupled with obedience. Otherwise, it's ineffective. So there was one plan of escape. Number two on your handout, Noah was a bivocational preacher. Second, Peter 2.5 says Noah was one of eight people saved and he was a preacher of righteousness. What if Noah, like Cain, decided to do it his own way? Well, I don't think I'll use tar. It gets all over everything, makes my clothes a mess, makes my sandals a mess. I don't like tar. There's got to be a better way. What if, what if Noah, would have, like Cain did, would have decided to do it? I'm going to bypass, I cut some corners here. We can, make, we can save some, some money and make it more efficient. Do you think uh, we'd be here today? I don't think so. Adam and Eve were forced out of the Garden of Eden because they decided to do it their way. Cain went out from the presence of God because he decided his way was better. Faith and obedience is always mandatory. All living creatures who did not enter the ark were destroyed. Genesis 7, 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I've seen that you're righteous, before me in this generation. The ark was a place of safety. Uh, the seven, Noah was instructed to take seven pairs of clean animals, a male and his female, and two pairs of unclean animals, a male and his female. There was no discussion or argument. Well, you know, um, can I take two of the same kind, two males or two females? Seven pairs. Well, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, there's an issue. Houston, we have a problem. Um, so the Lord was very specific. Seven clean, each pair a male and his female. Two pairs of unclean, each pair a male and his female. There was no discussion, no argument. The Lord said after seven more days, I'm going to cause it to rain 40 days and 40 nights. And verse, this is verse 5 of Genesis 7. And so Noah did according to the word is all, not some, all that the Lord commanded him. And after seven days, verse 10, the waters of the flood were on the earth. One day, in one day, the very same day, verse 13, Noah, his family, and all the animals entered the ark. Can you imagine that? Everybody, all those animals, everyone entered the ark the same day. And the Lord shut them in, verse 16. And the waters prevailed 15 cubits 
for 22 and a half feet over the highest mountain, verse 20, the waters of the flood prevail. 22 and a half feet over the highest mountain. The highest mountain peaks are the Himalayan mountain ranges, which uh, are 29,029 feet high, the highest mountain in that range. So 22 and a half feet over that, over the Himalayan, the highest Himalayan mountain, the waters of the flood prevailed. And verse 22, chapter Genesis 7, says, and all in whose nostrils was the, was the breath of life, all that were on dry land died, and he destroyed all living things on the face of the ground, man and cattle, creeping things, and birds of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. And so Genesis 8 records how Noah was delivered on the mountains of Ararat, and Genesis 9 talks about God's covenant with Noah, and, um, and he puts the rainbow uh, there as a sign of the covenant. And verse 12, verse 13, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for us the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And verse 5 of Verse 6, verse 6 and 7 of Genesis 9, Whoever sheds man, man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man, so capital punishment instituted. And as for you, be fruitful, multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply in it. And then I just want to close uh, come to a close with this last part about mankind ju uh, judged. We're going to turn to Second Peter chapter three. We've got about five or six minutes. Second Peter chapter three. It says, Beloved, I write to you this epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts, their own passions, or unbridled desires, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So next time, it will not be by a flood, but it will be by fire. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, in effect, we have to go against the will of God to lose our souls. God doesn't want us doesn't want anyone to be lost. But we are all created in the image of God with a free will. And so if our will is to be lost, then lost we shall be. But his preference would be that all would be saved.
but he will allow us to exercise our free will. And then it says in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will burn up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, verse 14, Beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. And we'll end right there. Praise God. There are more scriptures that are given in the handout. I encourage you to read those. We haven't hit them all. We'd go too long. And we've added some others so you can look at the video and add to this handout. But I uh, wanted to thank all of you. Uh, thank you, Alan and OJ. It always helps to have people. Uh, I thank the Lord for Brother and Sister Collins for being here. But it's nice having people here to minister to in the flesh. I know that we've got you out there and don't know how many there are, but uh, thank you for coming and, and uh, either viewing this teaching session of Exploring God's Word Lesson 2 live stream or after the fact as a captured video file. I'd like to pray and ask the Lord's blessing on, on everyone one more time. Lord Jesus, we love you, God, and we do thank you, Lord God, for... Uh, all that participated in this study. God, I want to ask special prayer for the Dillard household, brother and sister Dillard, that are sick. And uh, pray, God, that, that you would touch them and uh, bring healing to the whole house. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we take authority over the sickness in their bodies, in their homes. In Jesus' name, we set them free in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ from this sickness. We command the sickness, disease, whatever it may be, to go, to leave. That's a, that's a sacred house. That's a sacred family, saved and sanctified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we plead your blood over them. And God, bring healing and strength right now, right now over them. Set them completely free. No fever, no pain, no discomfort. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, we, we thank you. We believe you, Lord God, for miracle healing. Right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, God, for Sister Renee's sister, God, that is in the hospital uh, having a baby, Lord. And we pray, God, that everything would go well, that you would keep your hands, Lord God, upon uh, Sister Renee's sister, Rihanna, and uh, that you would touch her body and touch the baby, God, high-risk pregnancy, God. Lord God, Rihanna, suffering from a blood clotting disorder, not due until June. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, my God, you know the need and you know the situation and you know the faith, God, that we have in you. We believe you, God, to turn this situation completely around to give Rihanna, God, perfect health, perfect healing. God, to amaze the doctors and help her to carry this baby without further problem, full term. 
To God be the glory in everything, Lord God. Keep the church of God, the family of God safe. Protect all those, God, all the households that are represented by those that are viewing this video or are here tonight. And God, we ask for your protection, your healing, your hedge. We ask for your mercy, your compassion. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.